it's interesting tonight. Um, uh, I got this inspiration for this. I've been praying all week because I knew I was going to be preaching. I've been praying all week, Lord, what do you want me to tell the people of mortal life? What do you want me to tell the people of mortal life? What do you want me to tell the people of mortal life? And and so I've been I've been all over the scriptures seeking the Lord and praying and seeking the Lord uh, and trying to get inspiration. And last night I was going, uh, real quick, I wanted to go in um, and uh, have supper with Jill. I had to have a date night and knowing that I had to get back to the house and, and work on a sermon. And so I'm going in there and just this one word just wouldn't go away as we were going into town. And then it, it, it come across the radio, you know, <laughs> like, okay, Lord, I think I'm getting the message here. And it come across the radio and it's ba- basically is, is if we, he's, t- he was talking about the giants in our life. And, and so tonight's sermon is all about killing the giant, killing your giants, killing your giants, you know? And, and so, um, you know, many of us, we, we have all kinds of giants, don't we? You know, um, here's the thing, is that you're in one of three positions. You're either facing, you're, you're either dealing with a giant right now, or you've come out of dealing with a giant, or the good news is you're fixing to deal with a giant. You're in either one of those three positions, and and this is a this seemingly is is something that we do in our lives. Is that you know as the seasons of life come and go, we are constantly dealing with different giants that come into uh, into our lives. You know, some of them, some of us, we have the giant of fear. You know, the fear, fear of everything, fear, fear of failure, and then you know. We don't want to fail, but then we have fear of success. And so we're in this catch-22 kind of tension of, I don't want to fail, but I don't want to succeed. I don't know what I want, so we don't do anything. And so we're absolutely no good with God or for God. And so we have this giant of fear, fear of the past, right? Many of us have the fear of the past, the past mistakes that we did, past life that we've lived. Many of us have... Um, uh, all kinds of fears that that just grip us. Some have the giant of depression. Some have a giant of anxiety and loneliness, maybe a mental illness. Some have dealt with a giant of losing a spouse, right? A family member, a job or income, a sudden illness or a diagnosis, right? The giant of a diagnosis. Some, we deal with a giant of relationship issues, divorce, marital problems, others with addiction, others with uncomfortable situations, right? Dealing with uncomfortable situations. Others, we deal with a giant of just making a decision. We don't want to make decisions. I don't want to make decisions, Lord. Right? Some of us, we... we, we, we go and, you know, if somebody could tell us what to do and we would be okay, but the problem is we were rebellious. We really don't want anybody to tell us what to do either, but we, yet we won't make any decisions for ourselves because we're afraid. And so we're in this area, this tension that we find ourselves dealing with these giants in our lives. And so tonight um, we're going to attempt to unpack um, killing our giants, killing your giants. Because here's the thing, you know, you've, you've heard the movie or you probably, many of you have probably already seen the movie Facing the Giants. And, and it's one thing about facing your giants, but it's another thing about killing them. You can face them all day long, but until you put them to rest, until you put them to death, they're still there. They're still confronting you. And so we want to uh, encourage you not only to face them, but to kill them. To put them to rest, right? So there'd be nothing but pushing posies. And so in First Samuel chapter 17, of course, you know where I'm going. Almost probably before I said it, we're going to be talking about David and Goliath in First Samuel um, chapter 17. I want to pick it up in verse 4. And, you know, here's the thing is that in some places down here, I'm probably going to mess up the words because I have a hard time with these names. But hopefully you'll forgive me in the process. But it says here, 
and there's a lot of scripture, so I'm going to try and take a piece of scripture, break it down, take a piece of scripture, break it down, because I'm, I'm, I'm preaching through 51 verses here, Colin. So we're going to see if we can do this in a, in a way that uh, is productive. And it says in there, in verse 4, there it came out from the camp of the Philistines, a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, what you have to understand is, is that in the Valley of Ephan, um, the Philistines were encamped on one side of the mountains, and the Israelites are encamped on the other side of the mountain, and this valley is in between the two, and they're fixing to go to war. They're fixing to go to war with each other. And so um, they were trying to, uh, some would say, and, and I'm not sure I agree with this, but some would say that they're, they were um, implementing the old age of, of uh, battle, politics by sending out their champion to meet another champion. And so instead of literally tens of thousands of men dying that day, there'd be one man die. And what it was, and, 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 and we'll see it as we work through it, but what it was basically is that, you know, the Philistines and the Israelites, they were fighting forever. They were fighting each other forever. And we pick it up in verse 5, and he says, and, and he had a helmet of bronze and his head on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a, bron a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer, went before him and he stood and he shouted and, and to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for, you, for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be with your, our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You see, here's the thing about the enemy. The enemy here of Israel and the enemy of your life is he loves to intimidate you. In any way, shape, or form, he wants to come against you and intimidate you and be a loud mouth. Many times we hear the enemy chirping off in our ears, but we don't hear the voice of God. We'll hear the voice of Satan before we'll ever hear the voice of God because Satan is loud and obnoxious. It's interesting here, and, and I never really, I've never really seen this before, and I may be stretching it, and I just confess that to you right now, but when you look at, when you look at this in verse, uh, in verse 8, it says here that he comes out and he says, I, Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? What is he doing? What is the enemy doing? He is attacking their identity because David affirms who they are in a, in a, in a, in a few verses from here. It's interesting that Goliath was approximately, and, and theologians, you know, th most theologians can't agree on anything. And so we have to give a window here. Most theologians think he was either between nine foot and nine foot nine, right? A big dude. It, you know, when they were comparing him to Shaquille O'Neal, who is seven foot one, Shaquille O'Neal, my understanding is he wears size 22 shoes. Goliath would wear some type of shoe, probably a plus 30. So he's a big dude, right? His coat of mail, which is an armor that goes over him, weighed 125 pounds just itself. The tactic of the enemy was working, no, wasn't it? You see that in, in verse 11. It says here, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. His intimidation was working. He was one man. Okay, he was a big dude. But he's only one man. Picking it up in verse 12, it says, Now David was the son of Ephraim of Bethlehem in Judah, 
named Jesse, who had eight sons in those days of Saul. The man was already old and advanced in years. And the three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to, to the battle. And the names of these three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the next to him, Abimadad, and the third, Shema. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For, the, for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. Now, this is interesting because you'll remember that David was anointed king just a few chapters before, and he became Saul's armor bearer. Well, why wouldn't he be there at the, at the at, you know, why wouldn't he be there? This is war. Well, you have to understand that, that armor bearers actually practiced, and he was too young to go to war. He had Saul had an armor bearer, but it wasn't David that day. Because David was still kind of being in being mentored into this armor bearer position, and he was going back and forth to his father Jesse's house, feeding the sheep in Bethlehem. But you'll notice the here's the thing that, that's crazy about this in verse um in verse where is it here? In verse 16, it says, For 40 days the Philistine came forward and took a stand morning and evening. And here's the thing about a giant, it doesn't go away. This giant, these giants that you have in your life, they're not going to go away. And when the enemy comes and tempts you with these, with these situations in your life, it's going to do it night and day, day and night. It's not going to go away. We've seen, you know, here's the, thing is, here's the thing about the Israelites. They dealt with giants before, didn't they? You'll remember the story when they were coming into the promised land, when Moses sent the 12 spies over, what was the biggest thing? What was their biggest complaint? The people were too big. There was only two of them that had any faith at all, Caleb and Joshua. And so what did they do? The Israelites chose to not confront their giants. What did they do? They chose to wander around in the desert for 38 years. But when it ultimately, what ended up happening? They had to cross. They had to cross and go into Jericho and face their giants. Just took 38 years to do it. You see, here, friends, your giant's not going anywhere. That giant of addiction, that giant of relationship issue, that giant, whatever it is, and there's many of them. And here's what I want you to want you to know tonight is that we all have them. We all have these giants in our lives. And my giant, it might not mean anything to Cullen. Number one, because it's not Cullen's giant, it's my giant. But it's here's the here's what I want you to know. It's all relative to us. <laughs> because some things that might be a giant to my life isn't a giant to Scott's life because it's just not. The thing that's a, gi a giant to Glenn's life might be not a giant to my life. That doesn't mean it any less of a giant, though, does it? Right? Just because somebody says, well, that's not really a giant. Well, it sure is in my life. I'm dealing with this. In verse 13, or excuse me, in, in verse 17, it says, And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephed of the parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousands. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley ephed fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And the Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath, by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard them. 
all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, flee from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. You know, the interesting thing about this is that when David got to the encampment, they were going out for battle. The army was going up. They, were, they had moved into their positions for battle. You hear that they were making the battle cry. Now, this is interesting because I've kind of, I don't know, I think maybe I've taken some liberty here, but I think that the actual Philistines were afraid of the Israelites. I think they were afraid of the Israelites that they could actually beat them in a no, 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 battle for battle. And so they chose to send up Goliath against one man because he was so big. Well, here's the thing. If there's 10,000 guys coming down and old Goliath is there, he has not got a hope. He hasn't got a hope. But to one man, one nine-foot guy against little David, which for most people think he was probably somewhere under five foot four, probably closer to five foot two, just a little guy. But you know what they say, right, Jesse? Small things, you know, dynamite or C4 comes in small tight packages, right? That's what little men say, anyways. <laughs> So David goes up, and he's, he's going to his brothers, and he arrives to hear Goliath out front of the enemy's armies, challenging the armies of the Lord. And he had did this many times, didn't he? We just read it. He did it 40 days and 40 nights. But there was something different this time. There was something different that was happening this time. David heard it. David heard it. David heard it. And see, this is what's good. Gets a, this is where it starts to get exciting. He said, David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for a man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of his, from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should divide, defy the armies of the living God? You see what David's doing? He's reaffirming his identity. We're the armies of the living God. What the heck? And the people answered him the same way, and so shall it be done to, to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumptive, presumptiveness, presumptions and, and the evil of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? Interesting interaction there. And he turned away from him toward the other and spoke in the, in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. And when the words of David spoke or heard, they repeated them before Saul. And he sent him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail. Because of him. Your servant will go, to, go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine, to fight with him. For you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when he came, when he came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from his flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of, out of its mouth. And if he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will deliver me. From the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And then Saul clothed David in his armor, and he put on a helmet of bronze in his head, and clothed him with a cloak of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried to in vain to go, 
for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And so David put them, put them off, and he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistines. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hand, into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to, near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put in his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. And so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. He struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. You know, interestingly enough, when you look at this story, you see some real um, interesting facts. The obstacle of the, of the giant in David's life and in your life is the very opportunity to experience God. I love that about God. He brings the, you know, most of the time, these giants that come into our life are made by us out of bad decisions. Or just life happens. These giants raise up. But God is so much bigger than our giants. One of the uh, David's, David's qualifications. It's interesting that immediately, what does the Philistine do? What does Goliath do? He be, or excuse me, what does Saul do? Saul begins to question his qualifications. Oh, come on, man, you're just a youth. Many theologians think he was probably between 15 or 16 years old. Probably just a little wiry guy. But he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. You see, if you read the chapter before that, at the anointing of, of Samuel, anointing King David, it says the Holy Spirit rushed upon him and stayed with him for the remainder of his days. You see, he had the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The, 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 what we would call today the baptism of the Holy Spirit to carry out the work of the Lord. Interestingly enough, David reaffirms who they are by proclaiming, we are the armies of the living God, and that the Lord delivered me then, and he will deliver me now. He's making a prophetic statement. No, 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 my God has delivered me, and he will deliver me now. I don't sense any I don't sense any fear in David whatsoever. As you read down through that, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of sound mind. And when we have these giants that come into our life, we can boldly go to the throne of grace and walk either over these giants or through them. But God will give us victory. He will. And here's the crazy thing is that. Most of us know it. 
Most of us know it, but when the giant comes, boy, we cower, don't we? We back up. We worry. We worry. We fret. We do all kinds of things. David proclaims the battle is the Lord's. He will succeed. Here's what we have to understand is that the battle, God's going before you. He is your front and rear guard. That's what the scripture says. Do you believe it? Do you believe that God is your front guard? Do you believe that he's your rear guard? Do you believe that he has you in your best interests? These giants that come into our life, the giant of anxiety or the giant of, of addiction or the whatever it may be, they come into our lives and, and, and God empowers us. The crazy thing is, is that not only do we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit on us, but we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit that empowers us to walk in newness of life regardless of what the giant is. So what do we do when these giants come into our lives? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to recognize that that's normal. We all have them. We all have giants that come in to our lives at certain seasons of our life. They're different, but they're all relative. Meaning my giant is my giant and yours is yours. But here's the thing. We have to specifically identify the giant. But don't be surprised that in the process, it attacks your identity. Because that's what the enemy does. He loves to attack our identity. At some point, you're going to have to face the giant. We've read, you know, that, that um, movie is a great movie of facing the giants, right? Well, someday you're going to have to face your giant. It doesn't go away. It just doesn't go away. You're going to have to face it. And the quicker we face them, the quicker we can be relieved of them, the quicker we can kill them, right? Like the Israels, Israelites, the enemy likes to taunt us day and night. When that giant comes into your life, like let's say for an example, you lose a job or you have this big financial burden that all of a sudden comes on, onto your plate and you don't know how you're going to take care of it. And you go to fretting and you go to worrying and you don't know how you're going to do it and you're just trying to do all the things that you know to do and it's still not enough. But God, but God will get us through that. I can tell you time after time after time in my personal walk with the Lord is that, that the huge giants that have come and, and I've mentioned to you them to you hundreds of times, but the one that's coming to my mind right now is the giant of having a payroll get sucked out of your bank account every Thursday for two years where the Lord took care of that for two years every Thursday. And in different ways, the Lord supplied the need of that giant. And I was able to finally kill it. But you know what? It takes faith. It takes faith to kill our giants. We have to believe that God is bigger than the very giant that we're dealing with. You know, one of the things that we never seem to do, we never seem to remember. Think about it for a moment. Most of us here are. are um, We've got some experience behind us. And most of us, if the truth be known, have got, God has killed many giants in our lives already. But when that next one comes, we forget. We have amnesia or something. It's so crazy. You know, there's a couple things that we have to remember. Number one, we have to remember whose we are. Do you know who you are? Do you know that you're a child of God? That you know that you're a co-heir with Christ, that you've been adopted into the family. Some of you say, well, I'm not Jewish. No, it's okay. You've been adopted into the family. You have so many rights and so many benefits and so many privileges. And when the giants come, is God not the God? Is he not God that created everything in the heavens and earth? 
Scripture says, if God is for you, who could be against you? It's a great question, isn't it? Who? Who could be against you? Really, there's only one. And here's the thing. Many of you are going, well, I know it's the enemy. But you know what? It's more the person looking in the mirror back at you. It's more the person looking in the mirror back at you than it is the even enemy. Because honestly, the enemy has no power over you whatsoever. Only what you're willing to give him. Remember the victories. Many of us have these victories. Like the Israelites. Think about them. I mean, how many victories had God had given them throughout the time that he brought them out of, out of Egypt? A list, a, a string of things from here to the door long, but yet they forgot all them when old Goliath is out there. One man. One man. We can't get too condemning on the Israelites because we have the same thing. We forget these victories. You know, our truck breaks down. We're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to pay for that? When God supplied the money for it, the 12 times it broke down before that. Right? I can't get the, you know, things are tight and I can't make the, the, the electric bill. But yet the electric bills got paid the last eight times that that's happened. I know I'm exaggerating things, but really seriously when we go to be when we go to look back and that's why i love journaling because i can go back and look and and see where god has supplied all my needs each and every time each and every day he is the god of provision he is the god that loves to kill giants giants in our lives we have to remember number one uh like we mentioned god is for us who can be against us but also we have to remember who's got all power and authority. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says to the disciples before he goes, before he ascends, he says, I have all power and all authority. If he's got it all, is there anybody else that's got any? No, he has it all. And Christ is in you and you are in him. So guess what? So do you. In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Ephesians tells us he is able through the power at work within us. What power is that? It's the Holy Spirit. He is able to get us through these things or over top of them or through, however you want to communicate that to kill these giants in our lives. The scripture says that the anointing of David the Spirit rushed upon him and stayed with him forever. Well, not, friends, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us if we're in Christ Jesus. He empowers us to walk this thing out in newness of life. But when we walk around, most of us are so afraid. We're afraid of our own shadow when it comes right down to it. And God's saying, go pray for that person or this person or that. Or, or listen, I want you to start a ministry. The, car the, the scariest moment that... that I ever journal was God said, hey, Rick, what would you do if you knew you, you couldn't fail and time and money weren't an issue? And I was just stupid enough to write. And at the end of me writing what I put down on the paper, the Lord said, go do that. That's what I want you to go do. And I challenge you, do the same thing. The Lord, Lord, listen. What would you do? What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail and time and money weren't an issue? Well, how can time and money not be an issue? Because God is above time. He's outside of time. And he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and beef prices are rising. So there's lots of money. He will supply the needs. He will supply the needs. But you know, we, we, we just get so bound up in this stuff. And we wonder why we're not experiencing the victory that God has given us. Because we don't remember. In Philippians 1.6, it tells us that he started a good work in you. He's going to complete it. 
Why would he have anointed David king if just a, few, a chapter later he was going to have him die in a Philistine fight? It don't make no sense. Because he's not. Well, why did he invite you into a relationship, one that's real, one that's meaningful, one that's personal, and then back out on you? It don't make no sense. Well, it don't make no sense because God doesn't do that. The word's very clear that he, his steadfast love for you is that he will never forsake you. He will never leave you. I love this last passage in Romans 8, 28. It says, all things work together for those who love God and are called to his purposes. There's a couple prerequisites there, right? Number one, you got to love God. In order for all things to work to good, you got to love God. If you don't love God, those all things, they ain't going to work for good. If you're not called to his purposes, it's not going to work for good. But here's the thing. When some of those all things start coming into your lives, some of those all things are the real giants in our lives, aren't they? Right? They start coming into our lives. The questions you need to be asking yourself is, do I love God? And am I called to his purposes? And if you answer yes to those two of those, you need to be jumping up and down because you know that they're all going to work for your good. You just got to figure out how to walk in his newness of life. Got to figure out how to walk in his power to press through and kill the giant. It's interesting that David picked up five stones when there was only one giant. Many say that he had brothers. I don't know. I think he just knew that there was other giants that were going to come along in his life. He figured he might as well have five just in case. Friends, it's an unrealistic expectation in Christ or out of Christ that we're not going to have to deal with these giants in our lives. They're going to come. Like I said at the start of the sermon, you're either facing a giant right now or you just come out of facing one and you already got him killed. Or you're fixing to go into facing a giant. You're in one of those three positions. So get used to becoming a giant slayer. That's what God's calling you to do. He's bringing you to these, these moments of crisis of belief. These giants that come into your life. Most of them, again, are our bad decisions. Or just life in general, because we live in a, fall, a, a sin fallen world, right? These situations come in, but God uses them to bring us to crisis of beliefs. Where when we push through, all of a sudden, the next time a giant comes, we're like, huh, all right. Jesus, kill him. Get him. I'll be right behind you. And let, you know, because what David did, what did David do? He said, the Lord will, will take action. But here's what I want you to know, is that David just didn't sit back, did he? He put it out there. He stepped forward for God to, to catch his foot. And when God caught his foot, he killed the enemy. What giants are you facing today? There's so many of them, we can't even name them, is there? Many of you are in the room today. You're facing giants. Some of you are facing a decision on, on you know, what to do next with your life. Some of you are facing a decision of, well, I've done all that. Now it's time to relax a little bit. Others are facing the giant of financial burdens. Others are facing the giant of, of you know, uh, the prodigal child, right? Others are facing the giant of just coming to the end of themselves, right? That's a giant. You haven't gone down this road before. That's a giant. Don't say the, uh, don't say the Lord can deliver me. You need to say the Lord will deliver me. Because he will. How do I know that? Because you're all here sucking air. He's delivered you many times, probably more than you care to admit. 
But you wouldn't be sitting here if he didn't deliver you. Each one of us is delivered. If you're here today and you're dealing with a giant, there's only one way to do it. There's only one way to slay it. You have to face it. It's not going anywhere. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I can just put just saying behind it. It might make you feel better. But it's not going anywhere. It's going to torment you day and night until you deal with that giant. And the quicker you deal with it, the more freedom you have. Hey, I don't know what giant you're dealing with tonight. But as we close in prayer, if you have a giant and you want to start to begin to deal with it, we'd love to pray for you at the end of the service tonight. So bow your heads with me as we pray. Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, you've given me to, to just kind of unpack this a little bit tonight, Father God. Lord, I know that each and every one of us have these giants in our lives, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would empower us, Lord, to grab a hold of the truth that you have for us tonight. Lord, that you want to empower us to slay those giants, whatever they may be, in whatever circumstance they are, Lord. Lord, we pray, Father God, that we would choose to believe in your goodness, in your power, and in your strength, in Jesus' name, and walk it out in our lives. For your glory and yours alone, in Jesus' name we pray.